My name is Kate Bluval. I'm a partner here at PwC, so I'd like to welcome you um, to the MIT Enterprise Forum event this evening, Follow the Money. Um, the panel that will follow me will be talking about kind of the future venture capital, what does 2011 potentially look like. We're going to take a snapshot back. It's a little bit dated in terms of data. We'll be looking at, at information as of the third quarter or ending September 30th, 2010. But it would, I think it sets a good stage in terms of what's happened um, and can be part of the dialogue in terms of what we might expect for the future. So I'll just spend a couple minutes going through that. So the, the Money Tree report that I will go through is um, presented by PwC as well as the National Venture Capital Association. And it's based upon data put together by um, Thomson Reuters. So reports in its 15th year, and what it does is it tracks core equity investments in venture-backed companies. So companies that receive at least one round of venture uh, funding or equivalent. And it captures tranche, tranches, not term sheets. So money's actually going into the companies. But it excludes debt, um, recaps, loans, pipes, et cetera. Um, I'm going to go, I'm not going to go through each and every slide in this deck that we have put together today, but if you'd like a copy of the presentation, I'd be happy to email it to you or any of the PwC people you might see around if you give us your card, we'd be happy to share it. Um, the data, and there's a lot of it uh, accumulated over 15 years, is available on the PwC Money Tree um, site or the National Venture Capital Association site as well as, ex eh, sorry, VentureExpert.com. So if we get into the data, um, for the third quarter of 2010, $4.8 billion went into um, 780 companies. Quite a decline. You might probably can't see the numbers from where you're sitting, but quite a decline from the uh, amounts gone in for the uh, second quarter. There were a number of significantly sized clean tech deals um, in the second quarter that were driving those numbers that didn't recur in the third quarter. So this is a, a year-to-date snapshot. And year-to-date, we've got about $16.7 billion invested by venture capitalists. Um, we clearly look like we're going to eke out 2009. I don't know that we'll get to 2008 levels, which would have been about 28.1. But we'll certainly, I think, see 2010 coming in higher than the $18.3 billion invested in 2009. So I guess good indication. We'll skip this slide, but go on to the next. Um, in terms of investments by region for the third quarter, um, not surprisingly, Silicon Valley uh, is well beyond any others. Uh, in terms of investing of $1.7 billion having gone in for the third quarter of 2010, New England, Texas, and New York Metro follow. And on the next slide, it's got the uh, information with respect to the top five. Uh, regions that we see on a regular basis, and New York Metro usually runs in the kind of third to fourth largest uh, investing by quarter. In terms of investments by industry, software led the pack at about a billion dollars having been invested in the third quarter, um, followed by biotech, and biotech and software tend to flip-flop uh, depending upon what quarter you're looking at. Um, but from a deal numbers perspective, software um, traditionally, and I think not unexpectedly, in terms of number of deals, exceeds biotech by a long shot here, 190 deals as compared to biotech at 108, just given the, the low capital intensive nature of the, the software industries that are, or the software businesses that are being started. And we'll skip this next one and go to um, New York Metro, which might be of interest to people. So um, from an investment perspective in New York Metro, uh, most of the money is going into software, followed by um, IT services or biotech. And of course, with the capital intensive nature of biotech, can uh, any one or two significant deals can drive the investment dollars there. Um, investments by stage of development is something that we also track as well. And encouraging here is that about uh, close to 30% of the money in the third quarter is still going to early stage deals. I think a strong indication that uh, people are still believing in new innovation and um, funding new companies. And again, uh, I guess similarly, about 30% going into early stage companies in New York. So again, I guess um, says a lot about innovation in this region as well. 
The, the uh, report also tracks um, investments by sequence or by tranche. So again, 25% of the monies are going into, or I'm sorry, companies um, receiving first, first rounds of financing um, represented about $1.2 billion or 25% of the monies for the third quarter. Again, still encouraging and holding strong relative to um, data that we've seen in the past in terms of new monies going into um, early stage companies. I think that's where I'm going to stop. Um, there's a lot more data to share, but I think that may, may set the stage a little bit in terms of industry and, and where we see um, where the money went in the past. And I'm going to turn it over to the panel. So that's a good segue to uh, my theme of the night, which is, is this the best of times for the VCs or the worst of times? <clears throat> I think Kate did a great job on the worst of times already. So I'll focus more on the positive. I just want to give you guys some data points. <clears throat> and then I'll turn it over to the panel. We're going to introduce them. We're going to have a good discussion. And I promise to get you out of here promptly at 7.30 for the bar upstairs. Which is working. So just a few data points in the best of times. I'm sure you guys have all read, you know, Twitter is worth $4 billion. Zynga is worth $5 billion. Um, Google uh, offered $6 billion to Groupon, which they just turned down. You know, two-year-old firm turning down $6 billion. Uh, pretty amazing growth. Um, and then if you look at the IPO market, it's, it's been very quiet. I mean, especially in New York City for technology firms. You've got a few notable exceptions. You've got AOL. You've got interlinks, and thanks to uh, Steve Brotman, you've got metadata, which has done quite well. So I think the, the other key, though, is in terms of what's on deck for IPO, it's really interesting to look at the pipeline. There's a lot of companies in the pipeline right now. Um, that includes the Ladders, estimated value of $800 million, the Gilt Group, Fresh Direct, Thumbplay, and Alex Yodel which is your uh, portfolio yep. company, correct? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to tell us if they're IPO ready or not, but it'd uh, be interesting to hear more about that. <laughs> so the other, the other uh, data points are, if you look at Microsoft, Apple, and Google combined, they have $90 billion in cash ready for acquisitions. Just those three firms, $90 billion. And I think this is actually the most important data point of all, is that Google just had their annual party in New York City and uh, they had a Joan Rivers impersonator and uh, 60s style go-go dancers. So are we getting to be a bubble again? What's going on with that? Be interesting to get your views. And with that, I'd like to, uh, Alex, if you could just introduce yourself, that'd be great, and just go down the road. Sure, so uh, my name is, <clears throat> excuse me, Alex Ferrara. I'm with Bessemer Venture Partners. Uh, we are um, about a two and a half billion under management, investing out of a $1.3 billion fund. Uh, we have offices here in New York, actually out in Larchmont, uh, you know, at the north of the city. So in New York, uh, Menlo Park, Boston, India, and Israel. Um, and we uh, are typical early stage as, as well as growth equity investments. We have about 45 investment professionals across the firm. Uh, we do seed investing. We also, uh, you know, I, I'd say the, the checks range from, you know, 100K up to about 45 million is the largest check we've written in recent years. But the sweet spot tends to be in the 3 to $11 million range. And invest across all of the sectors that were, were mentioned, software, you know, digital media. We have a life sciences practice, clean tech. Um, so, you know, sort of a, a, global, uh, a global macro fund. Great. Steve? Sure. Thanks, Ben. Um, I run Silicon Alley Venture Partners, which is uh, our Green Hill SAVP, which is a $100 million venture fund. We focus on um, tech-enabled services and information services. Uh, our, we lean more towards business-to-business -to -business opportunities, um, although we also do um, uh, a good amount of, of consumer as well, especially at the very early stages as they tend to be a bit more capital efficient in some respects uh, early on. Um, our, our deal size typically is between uh, 250000 and a million for uh, seed stage opportunities, which we do. Uh, we'll, we'll have about 10 in this fund. And uh, for core deals, those will run from uh, about a million, a million five up to $5 million in an initial round when we'll, we'll fall on uh, as, a, as appropriate. Yeah. 
My name is uh, John Frankel. Uh, I'm with FF Asset Management. We're the uh, smallest of the uh, venture firms here. Uh, we fit into this sort of super angel micro VC space. Uh, we're in the process of raising a $25 million fund and we probably won't let the fund you know, ever get bigger than that. We are investment checks of 50 to 250 on first investment, size up to one to two million as, uh, as the companies perform. Uh, we like to invest in a small team uh, right from the get-go and follow them as long as it takes. Uh, we don't focus on exits, we focus on growth. We invest in low capex models, um, uh, companies in single digit millions that we think can generate uh, 10 million of EBIT five to seven years out. Uh, we actually have an investment in common with Bessemer which is filed as S1. That was eight years ago when I first started investing. Um, when there are four employees, now they're hiring four a week. And I probably won't exit the position until four or five years, uh, fully exit the position until four or five years after they're public. Um, John, which company is that? Uh, it's Cornerstone On Demand. Software as a service, HR space, four and a quarter million users in 154 countries. So, yeah, different from the four guys in a room when we first started investing eight years ago. The, um, the it, it, We'll talk more about the market, etc. but I think you're seeing there's a number of individuals around the country doing what we're doing, which is bringing professional VC discipline into the angel market. And I think you'll look back five years from now and see a number of emerging firms that come out of our space, given the opportunities that exist. Excellent. Well, thank you. I think it's an excellent panel because we do have a variety of really early, early stage, early stage, and a little early mid stage. So it's a good variety. So the first question for the panel is, back to the go-go uh, -go dancers of the Google party, which I still find fascinating. Is that, are we back to the go-go days, or what's your uh, view of general of the market? I have no idea. It's, I, it's what I think of the questions we're going to go through. I mean, I, that's one of the ones I really struggle with. You know, I, I think there are definitely some fantastic signs. I mean, obviously, you, you see data points like the Groupon. Uh, you know, offer, and I just think it's it's fantastic. It's great to be, you know, it's great great for the uh, you know the overall startup community in the U.S. But um, you know, the question of whether it's a bubble or, or not, I mean, I just we we really debate that a lot internally. I think there are facts on both sides. Curious to know what you guys think. My my, my partner Brian <coughs> Brian Hirsch always feels, and we have this internal debate as well, um, feels that um, until you have exits. Um, that are that are silly exits for nothing companies in mass, uh, like we did in the, have in the '90s. Um, we're not quite in a bubble, and um, I have a hard time arguing with that sometimes. Um, but uh, I think um, you know, Ben, you mentioned sort of the tale of two cities uh, in your introduction, and and I I believe that there's different pockets of of. Uh, of, of the economy and of the venture world that are uh, definitely experiencing more interest uh, than uh, it, in particular since uh, the uh, social network movie launched uh, three or four months ago. I don't know how many people saw that movie uh, and uh, maybe this is a biased audience but um, I was uh, having lunch uh, two, three weeks ago with somebody and uh, actually, he was running a pretty, uh, like a mid-sized company, four or five hundred million dollar company. He'd sold it. His family was worth about a hundred, two hundred million dollars in that range. He'd still own a significant slug of the company. And I was sitting down with the founder, seven guys at the founder's, you know, small company. Uh, but they they'd already had some good success. And the the the, the conversation got to uh, sort of how do you cut a partnership deal? And uh, the the um, uh, you know distributing the, the startups product to his clients and reselling the, the clients and we were starting out well how about fifteen percent twenty percent commission if you will on the revenues generated from those clients and uh, the uh, the CEO and owner of this company stopped us right there and said I want equity I saw that social network movie <laughs> <laughs> I know what this is about. And he wanted to convert all of his, you know, all that reselling revenue into shares of the company. So while I'm not sure about where we are uh, from, a, from a financial perspective, it definitely, when I see signals like that 
and, and, and other elements. I mean, Groupon, yeah, $6 billion, but it also has $2 billion in revenue. Absolutely. I'm not sure I'd call that, you know, 1999 bubble. So, you know, that's just one, one aspect. It feels like things are going in the right direction. One other thing I wanted to also mention, sorry to take up so much air, air time here, is that as much, uh, there, as much as there are these, uh, I the interest in early stage, when companies get to B and C and D rounds, and we have, we've, I've been investing for, for 12 years now, so I've seen a couple cycles, um, uh, it is very difficult to, to raise money for companies that are beyond sort of the promise stage. That is sort of the, the uh, uh, Fred Wilson said, the ugly adolescent phase, where they're not quite, you know, Groupon, and not quite, you know, in the uh, um, in the startup phase, if you will. So, and in fact, that last slide that the that PwC showed showed a 50% decline in series, you know, essentially second, third, fourth, and fifth rounds, and flat for first rounds. So that says a lot about what's happening in the market, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the short answer is there's no bubble. Uh, longer answer um, re requires tying together a number of themes. So the first one is VCs have returned nothing over the last decade as a group, which means if you take out the top decile, you know, it's been a disaster for most LPs. Now, they, turning around a super tanker is faster than closing a VC shop because, you know, 10-year funds and it takes time. So there's been a, a dearth of returns and they're finding it tough to raise new money. So there's big changes going on in the VC space and there's sort of an existential problem about what are they about, particularly given the second theme, which is in software, Internet, VoIP, mobile, social, all of these areas, the cost of starting up a business has plummeted. It's at least one order of magnitude less than it was a decade ago. So we're funding companies with you know, half million dollar rounds, million dollar rounds that will get them to profitability. They'll stop living off the kindness of strangers. They don't need a room full of sun servers, free engineers to watch them. They can buy everything by the slice. You can get your email for free from Gmail, et cetera, et cetera. And so the costs of starting a business have plummeted. And this has caused issues for VCs. There's a lot of companies being funded at the seed stage. But even that, I wouldn't call the bubble. Now, what's happening in the Valley is a lot of Googlers are selling stock. A lot of Facebook employees are able to sell stock. So there's a lot of people walking around with a few million loose in their pockets. They clearly know how to make money because they got a few million loose in their pockets. So they're, they're doing angel they investing. They saw their social network. Maybe. They saw this. By the way, the social network <laughs> will be the Wall Street of this generation. Oh, absolutely. And I, th I think it's a pheno phenomenal movie. But I think Which it, culturally means. I think culturally it's going to be very important. Enormous numbers of people will start up. There's a lot of loose money around. Now, that's different than two years ago. Two years ago, um, I won't say Sakai. Was it Sakai who came out with a 100-year flood? A uh, deck that Rip. said... Good times deck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fire everybody you can. It's the worst of times. Well, the pendulum swung so far from that, but it's still not a bubble. So you've got a lot of companies being funded. You've got a lot of... But I'm, I have to interrupt. I mean, how could you hmm. say it's, it's... I'm just surprised to hear you say it's not a bubble. I mean, you know, given the valuations that you're seeing for companies that have no fundamentals, you know, no, no revenues, in many cases, you know, nothing more than the promise of having an audience at some point, you know, within a reasonable time horizon, are, are raising money at, you know, incredibly, you know, 40, 50, 100 million dollar valuations on a regular basis. And I don't want to go into specific names because there are companies that are in the market right now, but I think we're all seeing this. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that is a bubble. I mean, I, it's, it's uh, not sustainable. I think it's a bubble in certain sectors, and we'll get to that next, <laughs> in the hot sectors. My own view is you go through, you know, the typical cycle of fear, hope, and greed on Wall Street, right? And, and we've had a lot of fear for three years, and actually people get bored and tired of fear after a while. <laughs> they go to hope, and that Groupon's the hope, right? So what's 2011? That's the greed, that's the social network movie, is the greed. And now it's a weird mix. It's good. 
hope and greed. <laughs> greed is good. Greed is good. Right. Back to Wall Street, Steve. Exactly. Greed is good. But the, the, there's, 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 another, there's another piece here which I think is really important. There are major changes that are happening in the way people and companies are behaving. Absolutely. And there are companies taking advantage of that. Groupon comes from nowhere and generates $2 billion in revenue from nowhere. So, so Alex, this time I, it's different. Microsoft paid a ridiculous. <laughs> Microsoft paid a ridiculous price. Well, it's not exactly for, true. For, right? But they paid a ridiculous price for Facebook, which was actually a steal. Mm -hmm. You know, Twitter at three or four billion, wherever this next round's done. I don't know if that's going to be cheap or expensive, but I'm telling you, the world is changing dramatically. There are small, subtle changes that people have changed in the way they go online, which is enabling enormous monetization. So, so people often make this argument that it takes less, you know, fewer resources to, you know, to, to start a, an internet company today, and that's clearly true. I mean, you can, you know, the cost of software, of infrastructure, uh, of, of customer acquisition have all have all come down. And the world is a smaller place as a result of social media and LinkedIn and, and Facebook. It's, it's you know, it, it, there are, I, I would agree, there are tremendous structural changes that have provided that advantage. But the largest cost is still labor. And, and that has not changed. Uh, you know, if anything, it's, it's increased, right? I mean, you know, so, I, I mean. It's increased because salaries have gone the up. The notion, yeah, I think, you know, they've definitely, salaries have definitely gone up. Let's assume, though, that they've, they've you know, remained the same, um, which may be a you know, gross over-assumption here. Uh, you know, I think over the last, uh, you know, if you look at many of the companies today, people often paint this picture of uh, a lot of these internet startups being able to get to break even on nothing, and then you know having a lot of flexibility around that. But I see a lot of early stage companies that are, you know, still burning cash. They, you know, they they in theory could get to break even, but they don't for one reason or another. Uh, I don't know if it's because they can't or because they they choose not to. But you know, I think what's changed in my mind is it, it's the amount of capital to get to a relevant. Uh, proof point, the relevant point of market adoption is, is much lower. And that's fantastic for, uh, for entrepreneurs in the internet sector. But I don't really, you know, it's not clear to me that the capital needed to get a business from that point then on to becoming a, you know, a large, you know, a large viable, uh, you know, business that can feed itself. It's not really, you know, in my sense, that has not really changed as much. It's still, as we look across our portfolio, and we did this, uh, you know, over the last uh, year or so, it still takes on average 20, 25 million dollars, you know, and it varies from that point, you know, for a company to get from that proof point stage to an exit, whether it's an IPO or whether it's a, you know, an M&A. Yeah, uh... that's, that's, that's to be proven. And I, th I think that's been the case historically. My understanding is Google raised about 25 million of external capital until they could self-generate capital. That was a company built when you needed a room full of sun servers. If Google was built today, I would suspect they wouldn't need so much capital. The question's going to be, and we can only answer this question in five to 10 years. You mentioned Groupon. So yeah. you know, Groupon raised $20 million before they, you know, they've they raised, you know, prior to the DST round, which was mainly a secondary round, I think they had raised north of thirty million dollars. So you know, it's not as though you know they just all of a sudden shifted this business that that you know that Andrew had started called the Point into this new business model, and it generated a ton of cash, and that was it. I mean, they they did raise capital that they used to build the local sales force that had to beat on the street or you know, on the phone, knock on doors, and, and sign up local businesses. Uh, I think what we're seeing actually, we do merged acquisitions and agile equity, and we see a lot of activity, a lot of early stage capital going into companies. But to Steve's point. They're having a hard time getting the B and the C rounds. And they're looking at M&A exit earlier and earlier as well. You know, should I sell now for you know, 25 million, 100 million, or wait to become a Groupon and sell for 6 billion? And, and a lot of them are deciding to sell early because they're going to take their money, start another company, and do the next round. So that's what we're saying. So this, and that, and that's, that, that, that's consistent with what I was saying, that VCs mm -hmm. are in this really tough situation. Again, a lot of companies funded at the early stage, some of them milestone funded, which I think is an issue, which is you're not funding to profitability. But if we hit some milestones, then we're going to raise more money. And I think there's going to be a lot of VC stage companies that are funded that won't get to the next level. 
Mm -hmm. um, but like you, we see hundreds of companies and we invest in a handful. We invest in one right. to two percent of what we see. So I'll tell you, you know, the 98, 99 percent we don't invest in fit within people who've got wrong business models, people who are, who've got wrong ideas of valuation, a whole series of stuff. I'm presuming those guys don't get funded. Now, if you're telling me all other people are out there funding them, then, then maybe. But um, I'm just telling you, for the companies we end up investing in, valuations haven't gone up. The opportunities seem to be phenomenal. We're seeing better, high-quality companies at reasonable valuations where we think we can help them get to that next stage. And, and you know, so I'm not being frozen out now. I know there are other people who say, I can't buy stuff, I'm being frozen out. And those people generally live in San Francisco. So there may be that dynamic. That, that's fair. I mean, we spend, all, you know, I would say, you know, a lot of our investing is right in San Francisco and outside of New York. So that may, that may be part of it. Yeah, so regionally, there's some well, differences. We have, we, have, we have California investments, San Fran, yeah. Valley, um, LA investments I guess as well. It's, uh, you know, it's geographic, it's by state, but it's also by sector. So the next question for you, gentlemen, is so for 2011, What's the hot sector? Is it clean tech? I'm just joking on that one, by the way. <laughs> Go ahead. What is it sector based? I mean, Groupon, Facebook, they all kind of fit the internet theme, right? Well, I so think is there, is there other areas that are hot, or what are you guys investing in? If a, co if a company came to you and said, hey, I'm in this X sector, what would be appealed to you most and least? No, I think, I mean, I think whether or not there's a bubble or not, that, that is, at the end of the day, um, more academic. You know, one of, John is pointing out that it, whether there's a bubble or, or if there's a bubble, he's getting in so early that he's way before that wave, right? Yeah, I, I, right, so let me be this way. I hope there's a bubble, right. and I can get in before that. Right, <laughs> right. So if he's getting in at if he's getting in at a million five valuation, right. early, early, early. It really doesn't second. matter so, so much, so right? There is, you know, there have been a lot of blog posts about. Uh, angel investors, super angels, claiming that valuations are creeping up. I think you know Chris Saka just you know had had announced that he was not he was freezing his investments right because valuations had, had gotten gotten so high. And so that while it's true if you're investing at you know at one and a half million or two million you know dollar valuations, when all of a sudden those valuations go from two to five to seven right. eight, that's a four x increase. Yeah, we're not, that, not that's what he's, he's capping so, himself and saying. Uh, if it's over 1.5 or $2 million, I'm not interested. I'm seeing so many opportunities at the million and a half, two million right. and a half, three million and a half pre right. that I actually, I have the opposite problem. We try to make, you know, four to ten investments a year, and I think we're closing on five this month. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's Fantastic. one, and, and I actually agree with that strategy to the extent that we do seed stage deals. That we're talking relatively low single-digit millions um, going in at, at that phase because uh, it protects you. What happened during the last bubble that, that we were in is that in 1999 and 2000, we'd have entrepreneurs stepping in and saying, hey, we're worth $20 million, and we would just essentially cap out. We'd say, you know what, you hit my circuit breaker. No more. No more. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's much more about strategy, which is where Ben was pointing to. Sure. Um, so that's one of our techniques is, is just to sort of say, actually, if you look at the long-term valuation of seed stage and, and first round deals, the seed stage hovers between you know, one and three million, typically. And Series A is between four and six and seven million, historically, long-term averages. So if you, as long as you stay within those bands, um, we found um, you stay, you, you avoid those bubbles to, to a certain extent. Um, and so strategically, that's what we try and do. The other aspect is, you know, you joked about clean tech. Um, we, um, we purposely focus regionally uh, because we find that um, there's, uh, if you looked at the numbers again, you know, New York hovers between third and fourth place. So the market is, is much more inefficient. Um, and um, there's tremendous amounts of capital, 60 or 70 percent of the capital is in Silicon Valley, hyper competitive in a lot of ways. Um, Boston similarly has uh, you know, a huge proportion of the cap venture capitalists. And New York has really been a netherworld um, in the venture side, and it's been more opportunistic. Um, so that's another way where we try and limit uh, the potential of, of wildly overpaying. If, I mean, one of the reasons why I would say, 
that the venture industry is, has been zero to negative slightly over the last 10 years is they paid two times what the company was worth. If they, if they paid 50% of the value going in, they'd have a 2x right now, right? I mean, there's a number of reasons. So there's a number of reasons. The problem with this approach, though, you know, it, it's, you know, one can say that we're going to be very disciplined about price and we're never going to pay outside of a certain band. Uh, and, or, you know, for A rounds, we right. don't pay more than eight free, and that's that. Um, and that's, you know, that, that, that's one approach. I think there's another philosophy which yeah, says... Can you define eight, eight pre just quickly? Sorry, and eight, oh. you know, putting an $8 million valuation on the company so that if I invest $2 million at that valuation, I'll own 20% of the company and the okay. post money will be $10 million. So I think there's another philosophy that some people have espoused and I, you know, I think I tend to, to, to think, to align myself, you know, more, more carefully with, with, with which is, I want to be in the best companies. I, I want to be working with the best entrepreneurs. I want that to be the you know the the priority you know the in, in terms of making those decisions. And if that as a result causes you to pay outside of a band, then that's you know that's that's what you'll you'll have to do. And I think you know if you paid five pre or ten pre for Groupon, you're still you know doing incredibly well. Right. Uh, I think you know the point is you know some investors look at it and say I just want to make sure I mean Andreessen Horowitz is is publicly stated they think you know there are three worthwhile deals that get done in any year and they want to be in those deals and that's their investment focus so I just think it's a different way of thinking. About it. I'm, 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 to me, the biggest difference between this the space that I'm in, which is this early stage VC and larger traditional VCs, is if you're running a billion dollars. You get paid $25 million to do nothing. You have a fat management fee. You're an asset aggregator at heart. If you're running a $25 million fund, you get paid half a million dollars to cover your CFO, your space, your staff. You don't draw a salary. So if you can't generate the returns, right. you're not only, you're wasting your time and also you know, people who run small funds like me, we put a large amount of our own capital into the funds because that we believe in, in what we do. So we are driven so, by, but I just want to finish. Yeah. We're driven by carry returns, long-term relationships. We're not driven by how do we slice up this $25 million between this infrastructure we built. It's a, it, and that is one of the reasons why, and you see the studies, smaller funds, and it's like a curve, smaller funds outperform larger funds. The other issue at the early stage on the bubble side is there's a lot of lazy money. We've seen term sheets, we've seen signed docs where angels have wired in money, signed docs sent them in. And when we read the docs, we go like, we can't sign this. They go, why? I go, well, well tell me what you think the deal structure is. And CEO tells you, you go like, well, actually, that's not what your docs say. Your docs don't support it. And you know, we have a simple view. We take millions of dollars, give it to people, and we get pieces of paper. And we just have this view that in a few years, we'd like to give people pieces of paper and get back millions of dollars. There's a lot of lazy money where, you know, oh, wow, Dave McClure's investing, right? Ron Conway's yeah, investing, I, I, so look, I'm going to invest. So there's I, lazy I money look, out there, the stupid companies yeah, being funded. VCs are overpaid. People in private equity are overpaid. I'm not saying they're overpaid. I, 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 I'm talking about this let's, is an let's, alignment let's of that. interest. I think, but you know, on the specific question of whether there is a bubble, you know, my, my belief is in the internet space at every stage right now, it, it is a bubble. Uh, and I may be wrong, but but you know, based on the data that I'm seeing, right. you know, I think that's that's. Now, Alex, Alex, why is there a bubble now? Because are you guys? Let's bring in the super angels here. Are you guys getting competition from? Super angel money? Is that more well, of a Silicon Valley if phenomenon? The, and why is there a bubble? Because there's more opportunity, like the Groupon business model is if, brand new and taking advantage of broadband. And if you want to believe there's a bubble, it's one reason. It's the Ben Benank. It's the 0% interest rate environment that's persisted for the last decade. You know, I can make zero leaving the money in the bank, or I can make, you know, whatever investing in early stage. I might give up liquidity, but the returns are much higher. And that's what's happening. People saying, you know, what, what should I do? Right. And so this is a space, the early stage angel space has historically generated strong returns. People are chasing those returns. 
That's, that's why, if you want to take the bubble argument, it's because we have non-normative interest rates in the developed economies. And I don't see that changing anytime so soon. Greenspan, sort of the bubble in housing, you're saying that Bernanke's he's, he's, the bubble he's, in tech. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. He's, 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 saving a de a, yeah. he's trying to solve a debt problem yeah. by issuing debt. So, so uh, let's, we have a, a few more minutes left, but let's talk here, if you can, as much as you can. Obviously, it's confidential to some extent, but your specific investment strategy for 2011. You know, specified by geography, by sector. Um, you know, if somebody brings you a business plan, what would you react to? Be helpful for the audience, I think. I'll, I'll give the, the quick. So, you know, I, I think um, in terms of, of areas of focus, you know, similar to others, you know, we're looking at, at uh, social, we're looking at mobile. Um, I think in particular, if, if I think of the last 10 years of customer acquisition for internet businesses and software businesses, that it's, it's really been dominated by Google and, and mastering customer acquisition through SEO and SEM, I think the next 10 years will be about leveraging social media. And so you know, we've, we've made a couple of investments in companies that uh, primarily acquire customers through social media. We have one company called uh, Zeusk, which is one of the largest online dating sites that uh, was built on, on Facebook. Uh, we had another one called Playdom, which we, uh, we, we sold to, to uh, Disney this year. Um, and you know, we have a couple of others that are, that are not yet announced. But um, you know, I, I think that, that theme of leveraging social media for customer acquisition has been a you know, big area of focus for us and, and will continue to be. That's helpful. Uh, we tend to focus on uh, sort of the, the SaaS market, as I explained earlier, which, which tend to have recurring revenue streams um, and also have a, of a uh, tend to throw off a good amount of information uh, or data. And uh, there's a, been a confluence between the sort of the software world with, with tech-enabled services and then with information. So we think that um, we're still, you know, only partially way through this, this part of the uh, innovation uh, curve, if you will. And um, our thesis is, is that if you look at, um, and one of the reasons why there's been increased in New York recently is technology is commoditizing. And just like John mentioned earlier, it's getting easier and easier and easier to create these types of companies. Our feeling is that these companies are going to be created uh, by domain experts who understand particular business verticals, whether that's healthcare or publishing or uh, advertising or finance. And guess what? That's 60% of the economy, and it's all headquartered here. And who's going to be doing that? Well, 10 years ago, the people who were doing that were in Silicon Valley and Boston because it costs a lot of money to do these businesses. One, but two, there is specialized technology, uh, knowledge, and know-how. Um, but nowadays, uh, a domain expert in a particular vertical, um, we're looking at the healthcare industry. We're looking at um, uh, the publishing industry uh, or the uh, uh, SMB finance industry, you know, more and more people are coming out of those, of those verticals and saying, hey, there's a big opportunity here to apply technology to, a, to make this process incredibly efficient. So we tend to focus on these types of B2B opportunities that, that can morph into much bigger opportunities. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's really in a nutshell at the Series A. Those companies t require about $10 million in capital uh, total. Uh, to get to profitability, and maybe another $10 million to expand well beyond that. Metadata is a case in point. What, what Metadata did, uh, it was in 2002, uh, they started a company that shrunk the, um, the, uh, the, sa the, the cycle for pharmaceutical drug discovery by a year. It cost about $400 million during that process, or more sometimes, to create a drug. So if you can, and it takes four to five years. So if you can shave a year off that process, every day is worth between one and six million dollars to create a hit drug. So now how they did that was they simply took an analog process that was very paper laden, and instead of doctors putting notes in, in a paper piece of paper, photocopying that, putting that in a folder, putting that into a box which gets in a truck that gets shipped to somewhere else where it gets reopened, entered into a computer, and then a year later audited. By putting this whole process into a digital format, it saved a year out of the process, thereby releasing you know, tens of millions, if not billions of dollars of value. So 
you know, we, we still believe that, that the revolution that was started you know, 30 years ago in IT is really just now touching many parts of our, of our economy on the B2B side. Uh, and um, in addition, I mentioned the five sectors, advertising, publishing, healthcare, virtually every sector you looked at from as well as finance, um, they're getting rocked by huge disruptions everywhere you look. Um, disintermediation on the consumer side, and um, so we're also dabbling in the consumer side as well, and the B2B2C side. So we're taking, so that's really our perspective is applying IT to uh, these types of processes. Steve, to your credit, uh, Medidata is now a $500 million market cap company and up 27% from the IPO. Cool. That's fantastic. So yeah, John, uh, you've got about a minute, and then I want to go to Q&A for 10 minutes, and then John's okay. going to leave the airport at 7.30, and the bar is open at 7.30, which is a so, good coincidence. So I, I think a lot of what you said, totally agree with. We don't let themes drive returns. We let returns drive themes. So we look at a lot of things, and then when you end up looking at what we invest in, there's a number of themes that percolate up, and there's three that I want to touch on which are intriguing me a lot at the moment. The first one is, I don't think you'll leave your CPU on your desktop five years from now. I think it'll sit in your pocket. There'll be a display, an input that you'll probably leave there. Though Pico projectors may deal with display, they even can deal with input. I think mobile and building for mobile is really interesting. One of our portfolio companies actually designed their website based on their mobile app, and I've talked to another, uh, based, and that's an iPhone format, I've talked to another, say, why don't you design the app for the iPad and then use that to redesign the website? Uh, so that's mobile. Social, and I want to tack social differently, and I'll try and give you the condensed version of this. When I first started to look at the internet 15 years ago, it was all about data. Then we talked about the internet of things. I think once LinkedIn and Facebook encouraged us, trained us, made us come online in real name, we started what I call the Internet of People, which is built around trust, identity, reputation, and influence. And so we look at companies that are attacking trust and identity and reputation and influence, not because we're digging by that theme, but when we come across companies with that theme, it sort of resonates with us. So we're invested in clout, which is trying to page, take the page rank algorithm, apply it to people. So Google started by page ranking the web. Clout is people ranking the web. And by the end of first quarter, they should have 100 million people real-time index for influence, a score from zero to 100. And then the third theme, and I'm borrowing this from some, plagiarizing somebody, but I can't remember which blog I read, but it resonated with me a lot, is the splitting of the internet into layers. So there'll be domain expertise for people who have a data layer. So if I give you an email address, give me back a Twitter handle or Facebook handle, whatever it may be. There'll be people at different layers. And just as software, you know, people talk about software having stacks and operating system layer and application layer, I think the internet is going to layer out as well. And there'll be very interesting companies that will be very dominant for a very thin slice of that layer. And we're looking out for those companies as well. But again, we're, we start with can we generate, you know, which companies are going to generate the returns and we back into the themes, which is a different approach uh, than some others. That's great, John. Thank you very much. That was no very problem. interesting. So uh, now we have about five minutes for a question and answer session. Liz, go ahead, Don. Sure. I'd like to go back to the earlier discussion about uh, early stage uh, investment and infrastructure costs. It seems to me the conclusion that you were pretty close to reaching was that as infrastructure costs literally approach zero, it almost acts as a crutch for early stage companies. It becomes that much more easier to come to profitability very early in their life cycle, uh, which would kind of cause a bubble with early stage companies in terms of valuation. But once they reach the barriers that larger companies would traditionally encounter, like, uh, uh, like human resources, like customer service, like real estate, that type of thing, you'll get the same type of fall off that you would traditionally. So do you think cloud computing might be a crutch in causing a bubble in early stage companies because they don't have to deal with infrastructure costs? I think it generates more, I think there's more competition. If, if I was 22 and I couldn't get a job, which a lot of very bright 22 year olds are in that situation, I can sit on the couch or I go and start a company. Well, the cost difference between those two is a lot less than it used to be. 
So, and there's a the number of incubators opening up in New York. I, I think New York's in the early stage of a, a renaissance here. So I think the answer is it's easier to start the companies. I think those cost structures that come in when you're much larger, I mean, maybe it happens when you get to Google. It's probably happening at Twitter now. A lot of people feel there's some dysfunctionality in how they communicate. But I think that's just a matter of putting certain layers in. I don't, but I think those are larger company issues. I think when you're going from three employees to 20, even up to 60, you can do a lot of damage. You can generate a lot of revenue with 60 employees. I didn't know how many employees Kayak has now, but they have one-tenth, I believe, that of Expedia, which disrupted a bit. You know, so you've got a disruptor coming behind. So I think less so. I, I think it's overplayed. The, it's, it's, it's definitely good that the entry, the price of entry has gone down. Um, but I think to truly execute, um, it, it's not about, it's in some instances on the consumer side, it's about being there first and virally spreading very quickly. Um, but um, more often than not, it also boils down to uh, execution and domain expertise. So even if you have um, uh, the, the seedling of this little company, uh, I was just having lunch with someone in the gaming space, and you know this thing's been throwing off revenue for some time. He doesn't have the staff to turn that into a much bigger opportunity. You still require capital, as Alex said, to bring into that that next layer of um, of opportunity. It doesn't. Uh, I was just I was interviewing a CEO earlier today um, for for a company we're looking at, and. You know, at the end of the day, that person knows 250 of the Fortune 500 and knows how to sell that product into those companies. They're going to beat every other company out there with a, with a widget uh, online with the 22-year-old kid every day of the week. And that doesn't mean that 20-year-old kids aren't going to create the, a world-beating opportunity. Um, it just means that um, I think that uh, I think we're oversimplifying um, what, what this burst of, of new companies really means. Uh, I think we have time for a uh, two more well, questions. Oh, sorry, just a quick comment on that, sure. which is I, we've been focusing on the cost side of the equation, but I think also on the revenue side, as you, you often see in software businesses, over time the marginal cost of, of software goes to zero, right? I mean, software prices continue to drop. And, and I think if you look at the trend, you know, what you're able to charge your customers for products today continues to decline. Almost everything you know, these days is, is, you know, is free. Um, and you know th that I think also contributes to the need you know, to the challenge of of needing capital to get to a certain level of scale. You know because it used to be that you could get to a million users and that was something, and, and you could charge them something perhaps to, and build a business there. Today, you know the the barrier, the, the sort of hurdle you need to achieve is that much greater because I think this trend of customers not being willing to pay for for so costs software. are down, but also revenue is down because we're deflationary environment essentially. Not necessarily deflationary, just deflationary, just the expectation that. Um, over time, competition is cre creating more and more, uh, you know, free alternatives. Sure, there. please. Yeah. Uh, I'm intrigued by John's comment of this uh, in layers of uh, opportunity. The layers of internet. Uh, yeah, on the thing. Why do you think uh, that uh, is defensible? I mean that there were no cross layer intrusions. One one of the terms I heard from a very very smart guy at um, a partner at Goldman when I, and this comment I heard probably 20 years ago, he referred to the term of outsourcing complexity. So if you're running a business and your expertise and one of our portfolio companies is hashable, so they're trying to disrupt LinkedIn, portfolio company over here, um, and, but they're trying to, one of the layers they need is a data layer that cross-references data. They can build it themselves, they can, they can spend a couple hundred thousand in terms of engineering costs and build it themselves, or they can pay $1,200 a month to buy that data feed. What should you do? You know what you should do. So you know, if someone's able to accumulate all of those $1,200, they can build a business. And what we found is the promise of Web 2.0, and I haven't heard Web 2.0, was that you would be able to plug and play. Right. More and more companies are building internally their own systems with an API that they use internally, and then they open it up externally. So I think it's simply, and I think the reason why we're doing it is a maturity in the architecture. But, but also, I'm not an engineer, but that's my read. So to be more clear, though, it's proprietary distribution. It's pro proprietary information that these companies have that no one else has, 
and, and oftentimes they're network effects. So then they also get proprietary distribution. Once they have proprietary distribution, that feeds the proprietary content. So instead of, I mean, Warren Buffett likes to talk about moats around businesses. Well, the moats are no longer technology. The moats are the data. Fantastic. Well, John, you have to catch your plane to London, and uh, we we'll all have to go to the bar upstairs for <laughs> drinks. So I'd like to thank our panelists. <laughs>